What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats podcast. I'm Phil Perry. We have an unbelievable, yes, unbelievable, not overselling it, even one iota, unbelievable interview with Doug Belk, who is a rising star in the coaching ranks. He's the associate head coach and defensive coordinator at Houston, works with head coach Dana Holgerson there. And of course, we wanted to have him on to talk about Marcus Jones, third round draft pick of the New England Patriots, Paul Horning award winner as the most versatile player in college football. Absolutely incredible production as a defensive back, slot, wide corner, boundary corner, even some packages where he was used as a safety and arguably the best return man in the country this past season. Played some offense as well. We're going to get into all of that with Doug Belk. It's a tremendous interview. I don't want to hold off on it any longer. So let's get right to the conversation right now. You guys are going to love it. All right. Very excited now to have with us on the next Pats podcast, Doug Belk. Doug is the associate head coach at Houston, defensive coordinator and defensive backs coach as well. Doug, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you guys. I'm glad to be here. Doug, I have to tell you right off the top, Marcus Jones, probably my favorite pick of this Patriots draft. And even going into the draft before we even knew that the Patriots had a lot of interest in Marcus, he just stood out as a, a perfect fit to play here in New England because of the versatility and because of what looks like incredible toughness for somebody who, who has the frame that he has and just throws his body around the way that he does. Uh, he just always felt like a great fit. He's a really fun player to watch if anybody had a chance to watch him before the draft. Uh, but what did you think of the fit with the Patriots when you saw that that Marcus went to New England in the third round? Uh, you know, I was elated. You know, I was very happy. I thought it was a perfect fit. Um, you know, nobody knows how to use players uh, with versatility better than Coach Belichick and obviously his proven track record um, over decades of being a coach in the NFL and the production that he's been able to use. And not only is he versatile, uh, but he's probably the most intelligent player that I've ever been around. Um, and so that that combination along with the Patriots um, and what they like to do with players like him, it was a perfect match. And uh, I'm really happy. I'm excited. I can't wait to see him play. How did that stand out to you, Marcus's intelligence, that part of his game? Uh, what what made it so apparent that he was as smart as he was as a football player? Well, you know, I had the pleasure of meeting Marcus um, when he was in high school. Um, you know, I was, a, I was an assistant at Alabama at the time. We worked him out and um, didn't end up coming in or going to Troy. And so I met him and his family, great people, uh, when he was a high school, when he was a high school junior. Um, and then obviously his transition playing at Troy State University under Coach Brown, they did a great job with him there. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to be the lucky people that got him um, when he transferred. So, you know, he was always been different, always been very intelligent, has a silent confidence that is unmatched. And, uh, you know, he, he was one of those guys who, when, we, when he got here, it was before the, auto, the um, immediate eligibility transfer rules. So he set out that year. And our head coach is looking at him on scout team like, this guy's unbelievable. Um, and then because when he walked in the door and we first saw him, I knew how good he was. Um, but when we brought him on a visit, um, people did not know, um, you know, how good he was. And, and uh, you know, for me, um, it tells you a lot about him. The guy was able to start at this level of college football um he was a two-way starter at receiver and defensive backs in certain games and he was a punt return kick return specialist the best in the country as well so um fast learner um can learn um a lot of different ways you tell him something once um and the sign of a great player like marcus is he coaches himself a lot of times so if he makes a mistake um he owns it and he's going to tell you hey i should have done this but they're doing this so be alert for these situations so uh, he's coaching me at times as much as I was coaching him. Well, and just looking at both of your your backgrounds, Doug, you and, and Marcus, it looks like you arrived at Houston around the same time in, in 2019 when he was transferring and, and you were changing jobs. Did did your arrival to Houston have anything to do with Marcus's arrival at Houston or was that uh, coincidental and, and just ended up working out well for both of you? No, he was in the first group of uh, he was in the first group of guys that we recruited here. Uh, so obviously our, our rela previous relationship at the time. Um, and then we had Coach Zach Etheridge, who was from that Troy area, um, who had a relationship with him, too. So 
you know, it just worked out and uh, we knew we could put together a special class and, you know, Marcus and um, a couple of the guys that we had drafted this year that were in that first class of us getting here who went through the tough times to, you know, kind of be the leaders and the catalyst of us going 12 and two. Uh, so he had a lot to do with that, the, the impact that he had on our team. And it seemed like every game that he played here, he made one or two plays to change the game for us to win or put us in position to win. So, uh, you know, very unique individual. Well, and just looking at your career, Doug, as a coach, and I know you spent time at Valdosta State, which is a school that that is familiar to some Patriots fans. Uh, you know, in terms of defensive backs, he might be kind of the one who got away. Kenny Moore uh, started his his pro career uh, yeah. with the Patriots and ended up moving on. And I and I think you would have been there right at the same time as Kenny. Is that right? Yeah, me and Kenny went to the same high school from the same neighborhood. You know, I recruited Kenny. Um, so that one was pretty special. Kenny went to the Patriots the same year as Cyrus Jones, who I coached at Alabama. Right. Uh, you know, so it's it's kind of funny, you know, how, how things revolve around. But, uh, you know, I would say Marcus is a combination of all those guys. And it's and nobody believes me. Nobody believed me when I told them that. But uh, when I when I give comparisons and uh, Kenny's a great player and a great person, uh, Marcus has very similar qualities as far as his off the field. Uh, you know, things that he does to give back, how important he is and how he communicates and how how he loves people around him and uh, a selfless teammate, uh, you know, played offense, played defense, played special teams, never complained and whatever uh, myself or our head coach or anybody want to ask him to do, he's always willing. Um, and as good of a player as he is, he was not stat chasing. Um, he's just an ultimate competitor uh, and very intelligent and understands the game of football on a high level. So, uh, we were able to use him in a lot of different situations. And if you watch his tape, he plays three or four positions in the secondary every game. Um, he plays corner in the field. He plays boundary corner. He plays nickel. And we even had a package where he plays safety. Um, and so that kind of shows you the versatility that he has. And then, you know, punt return, kick return, uh, slot receiver. Um, and, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a very – We'll miss them, and uh, and I think the Patriots will be glad that they have them. Well, now when you say, uh, you know, when you give your give comparisons for somebody like Marcus, so so, so what are the names that, that you list? You, you just mentioned a lot of reasons why he may compare. It sounded like to Kenny. Uh, are there other names that that come to mind for you as well? You know, I do think um, I think he from a from a mental standpoint, Cyrus Jones and and Kenny are both very intelligent. Um, and uh, he, but he has a Minka Fitzpatrick character and love of football and football intelligence about him, just comparing to guys I've coached. Um, but he has elite playmaking ability. And I think um, he's the most sticky, tight man coverage guy that I've ever been around. And his intelligence allows him to be elite in his own coverage as well. He's the first player that I probably ever coached that really has zero flaws in his game except being short. He has great long speed, he has ball skills, he's physical. He's intelligent, um, doesn't make very many mistakes. Uh, it's just the only flaw is that he he's short and uh, he's short in stature, but he, he plays big. And so, you know, he's, he's a tough comparison at times, but he's a, more of a combination of a bunch of different guys than just one guy in particular. Now, I, just for our listeners, you know, they should know what what high praise that is. I mean, they know now that, that you coached at Alabama, but some – unbelievable defensive backs that were there while you were there, including Cyrus Jones, including Minka Fitzpatrick, uh, Marlon Humphrey, I believe was, was there uh, was. And, and would have played under you as well. Kenny Moore, we already mentioned, but who's become a great player at the NFL level. So for you to say that, you know, there is no weakness to his game other than his, his frame, essentially, you know, that that's incredibly high praise. It, why will his frame Doug maybe not be a problem at the NFL level for you? Um, he's a lot like, uh, you know, Kenny and some other guys and his intelligence. So he's going to study his opponent. He's going to do very well in, in, in his, um, in his evaluation of who he's going against and he's going to play to his strengths. And I think the sign of a great player are guys who know their deficiencies and they know their strengths. So if he's going against a big guy, he's going to put himself in position to play the ball when it's at a certain point. Um, if he's going with a, a quick twitch, smaller guy in the slot, he's going to put himself in position to be sticky in man coverage. So um, he knows who he is. He's very confident in who he is. 
And he also is not naive to things that could get him in trouble in coverage or tackling situations. So I think that's what makes him different than a lot of players is he's very confident in who he is. He knows what kind of ability he has and he has a silent confidence about him that that uh, that he's going to p- compete at a high level and do very well no matter what situation he's in. When you look at the way he he sort of approached tackling, Doug, did, did that ever surprise you that somebody who is, I think he's listed 5'8", 175, you know, is just, just plays with the kind of reckless abandon that he does? Because, you know, we've seen some of the highlight hits and they are next level. And, and you would think maybe somebody with, with that type of size might not be all that willing to stick his nose in there the way he does. But uh, it clearly, from his time at Houston, at least, it, it, it looked like he has that willingness. Oh, yeah, he's more than a willing tackler. I mean, Marcus has a heart of a lion. Um, he doesn't say very much. Um, and I always tell him, don't let the smile fool you. You know what I mean? He's got that He's got that it factor with him no matter the situation. So I don't think any situation is going to be too big for him. Um, and he's, like I say, he's very intelligent. So depending on who he's going against is how he's going to tackle those guys. And um, you see him run through people. You see him, um, you know, roll tackling people on the perimeter. You also see him you know, sometimes cutting the ankles off of people if they're in those positions. But um, his awareness of the game is unmatched. And I think that happens to, to help him as far as making those type of plays. But um, he's an ultimate competitor. He's not going to back down from any situation. Is it, You mentioned the word sticky, Doug, when you talk about his ability to cover. Is that – what is it that allows him to do that? What physical trait is it that allows him to – you know, you mentioned his intelligence too, and I'm sure that helps – but is there a, a special attribute that he has maybe in terms of change of direction that it just allows him to, to mirror guys all over the field? Because again, you've been around some, some great athletes. So for you to talk about him yeah. the way you do, he, he must have some special qualities. Yeah. He's an elite, he's an elite athlete as well. Um, a lot of those guys you mentioned before are well, world-class athletes. Um, they're all pro NFL guys now and, you know, um, pro bowl guys and some of the highest paid guys in the NFL. Uh, and I'm not saying that Marcus is going to be exactly what, Minka or Marlon or Kenny is, but I think he's going to be the best version of who Marcus Jones is. But Marcus has elite balance and body control. And um, he goes zero to 100 very quickly. Um, So he's kind of like a cat. You never really see him on the ground. You never see him getting knocked over Uh, when he's taking on blocks, when he's tackling or when he's in in any type of coverage. um, He's pretty much always in great body position. Um, and, And he's got his change of direction is just, is uh, pretty impressive how fast he changes direction. But I think a combination of his balance and body control and then, well, due to – with the center of gravity and then how well he's he's able to, um, you know, change directions and accelerate uh, puts him in position to uh, be really good in, in, in man coverage situations and, um, and, and playing underneath zone at nickel. Um, you know, he's, he's very good with the disguise and knowing where to be and, um, you know, he's good at – you know, putting himself in between the quarterback and the ball um, where the ball's intended to go. And so it kind of makes him unique to have, be a rare combination to be able to do both of those things very effectively. One thing that's just really interesting, I mean, obviously the versatility. He wins the Paul Horning Award as the most versatile guy in, in, in the country. Uh, but it's so interesting to me that he has made this uh, this move from being primarily a defensive guy to, to playing offensively. And usually, and especially here in New England where Bill Belichick has used – You know, he's Matthew Slater as a defensive back and Julian Edelman and Troy Brown, offensive guys, you know, and and he will temporarily put them on the defensive side, not usually the other way around. I don't know if that's because of, you know, DB's hands, Doug, or or what that is. But uh, is there is there any chance you think he could contribute as a receiver at the next level, too? I mean, if um, in packages, I think so. I mean, I don't know that he's not as good on offense as he is on defense because if you watch him when he catches an interception or he touches the ball on a punt return or kick return, like you almost have to hold your breath. He's that good with the ball in his hands. And he's even more hard to tackle um, than most offensive players that we play on a weekly basis uh, based off his change of direction and balance and body control. And, you know, it's typically not one guy ever tackling him. Um, our head coach, uh, coached a couple of Patriot legends, um, and uh, Ed- and and uh, he coached Welker, um, and Amendola, right? And uh, he thinks that 
if Marcus played offense, that he his skill set was as good or better than those guys. It's as far as getting in out of breaks, the quickness, the hand eye coordination, um, knowing how to use his body as an offensive weapon. And you know, if if we um, if Marcus wasn't as valuable valuable as he was to our defense, he probably would have taken even more offensive snaps. But we wanted to manage his body um, throughout the season, and um, if he want, he actually wanted to play more offense than we played him at, um, but what we did not. And there's some interesting stats out there. I think him and Adore Jackson are only two people in, like, college football history. I mean, scored on a punt return, a kick return, offense and defense. Um, so it's a pretty unique, um, you know, um, thing for somebody to be able to do in college football. No question. And, and you can – you can understand why the Patriots would be so enamored with Marcus to see somebody who plays defensively the way he plays, who has the background, you know, that, that he has working under somebody like you, Doug, who, who coached under Nick Saban. And, you know, uh, I'm sure was learning a lot of, you know, those kinds of techniques that, that you picked up at, at Alabama and those would certainly translate to the next level, but between the athleticism and the versatility and the willingness that you mentioned that he has to do all those different things. That sounds like a Bill Belichick kind of player to me. The last thing I want to ask you, Doug, is, is there a story? Is there a Marcus Jones story that comes to mind for you? That's, that sort of defines Marcus, it, you know, when, whenever you hear his, his name, something that you'll never forget about Marcus, whether it's his time as a, as a scout team guy, uh, you know, in 2019, when he wasn't even, uh, you know, able to be on the roster coming in as a transfer or, or when he, once he became, you know, one of the best players in the country, is, is there a moment to you that, that stands out in your time with him? Man, um, there's several. Um, probably my favorite Marcus moment last year. Um, there's two. Uh, I'm going to just use last year for an example, um, which, like I said, Marcus was very cerebral. Um, he's not a guy I felt like I had to get after a bunch to motivate him to be great because he was so intelligent and so confident that you coach him in the meeting room. And sometimes I felt like he was coaching me, right? And so we were in a game during Memphis. Um, you could probably find this clip. It was on all the highlights on ESPN. And I don't know if anybody knows this or not about this play. So Marcus had the one-handed, left-handed interception in the Memphis game. Um, but pre right before that series, um, I don't, it's probably only happened one or two times. Um, I had never challenged Marcus, you know, the way that I had at that point in time because I typically didn't have to coach him like that. Um, but we were face-to-face. I challenged him and I thought he could play better in that game. And it was a time where we needed him to play better, not just him. It was everybody, but I knew by challenging Marcus, you know, it was one of those things that, you know, everybody was going to respond. And he was one of the leaders on the team. And my expectation was very high for him. And that next series, you know, he caught the one hand interception. He actually had two interceptions after that point in time, caught the one hand interception and the whole team was trying to celebrate with him. And, He's knocking their hands down as they're trying to celebrate. He sprints to the sideline and he puts the ball in my chest and handed me the ball. And so, you know, for, as a competitor myself, um, that's one of my greatest Marcus Jones stories that I probably never tell. Um, and then we needed to play SMU. I mean, he single-handedly dominated that game. Um, had a couple big-time pass breakups, a couple big-time third-down stops. And... Um, and then they go down and score. Um, I think it was probably the best playing college football last year. And they kick him the ball, which we didn't think they were going to kick him the ball. And before that series, uh, before he went out there, um, he had just made a big time play on defense, told him we needed him. And he said, I got you, coach. And he, they kick it to him. How's the game over? Uh, so those two are probably my favorite stories. And really, the Memphis deal is probably my favorite because um, he's so reliable and he's so competitive. And he's so um, intellectual. You know, sometimes he's not out there just talking trash like some BBs. And 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 he's uh, he's so focused on the job that he has to do. Um, but I, I would always try to turn him up a little bit every now and then. And, uh, and he always challenged me, too. So we competed against each other at times. So it was almost, uh, you know, kind of funny. And, you know, everybody asked me about Marcus. And, you know, he just has a lot of traits that you can't coach. And I think that um, his parents are awesome people. His dad coaches, and um, he was raised the right way. 
And, um, you know, his dad is able to challenge him and they have a very good relationship. So a lot of the things that Marcus brought to the table, um, it came from home. And um, and I think it's, it makes it even more special um, to coach him uh, coming from that type of family, those type of um, environments. And, you know, he played a little bit of, of offense both ways at Troy as well. And I think we just found a way to use him. Um, and at times I told him, if you, if you, even if you aren't getting the ball, be a good decoy because everybody's scared to death if he touches the ball on a kickoff or punt return or interception. So um, that's my that's my, kind of my Marcus Jones story. And um, everybody knows how I feel about him and uh, his ability, but even more as a person and even more as a teammate, how selfless he was over his time at, at, at the University of Houston. Those are great stories. I have to ask you, what happened to that ball? So he, he puts that he puts that interception ball right in your chest. Does that go away somewhere? Is that is that in the office somewhere? Is that just going right back on the field? I don't, I don't have the ball. Yeah. Um, I remember during the game, I was so uh, locked in. I, I, that's a moment I'll never forget because when I show that, that comes up a lot during recruiting and just um, NFL highlights pre-draft when he got drafted. That was one of the plays. So every time I see it, I, I kind of laugh. And I just remember the referees coming over looking for the ball. But I have no idea what actually happened to ball because they didn't give it to me or I don't think Marcus got it. So I don't know um, if it went back in the game or ended up in uh, in the ball bag or somebody took it after the fact. But it was a pretty cool moment for me and him because I never really had to challenge him like that. And I knew he was about to make a play. It was just only a matter of, matter of time. Oh, it's a great story. I'm sure it's a great memory for you and for him. Uh, to have that regardless of where the, where that ball ended up. But uh, Doug, this has been a, a great conversation. It's been awesome to have you on the podcast and learn more about Marcus on and off the field, how he's wired and, you know, what, what kinds of things we'll be able to expect from him on the field too. We're really excited. We're going to be able to get out onto the field uh, in a little bit to watch some spring workouts and we'll see if he's out there. And I know he's dealing with some, uh, some stuff physically right now, but uh, I'm sure it won't be too long before we're able to watch him play. And uh, he was certainly, one of the most exciting players in college football and we're just hearing all kinds of high praise about him right now so it'll be a lot of fun to to watch him in a patriots uniform so so thanks for teaching us a little bit more about him here doug i really appreciate it so interesting to hear about not only belk's background with jones tried to get him to alabama didn't get him to Alabama, ends up recruiting him to Houston in the last two years. That marriage has just seen tremendous success between Jones and the Cougars because Jones ends up, again, one of the most productive DBs in college football. Yes, he's 5'8", 175, but man, the guy knows how to play the football. He has real hands, which you could understand because he is being used offensively. And then all he gives you in the special teams facet of the game you can understand why the Patriots would like Jones as much as they do, despite his size. But what really fascinated me, maybe maybe the most of all the things we heard from Belk. I mean, he's, he's talking about Jones as the stickiest corner that he's coached when he's coached Micah Fitzpatrick and Marlon Humphrey and Kenny Moore. I mean, this is high, high praise coming from Belk, but it was the receiver stuff that fascinated me. And I'm sure... It perked up the ears of those of you listening at home right now as well, because I think there's a lot of folks out there who thought the Patriots might draft a slot receiver in this year's draft class. They didn't end up doing that. They take a receiver in the second round, Tyquan Thornton, and we're going to talk about him more on this podcast in the near future, but they don't get that traditional slot. No Kyle Phillips, no Khalil Shakir, Phillips from UCLA, Shakir from Boise State, these guys that even Sky Moore who ends up being a second round pick, somebody that the Patriots had the opportunity to draft when they drafted Thornton, but somebody who could be used inside and isn't necessarily a massive body. You know, he's not Welker or Amendola in terms of his height, but you know, they they didn't get that inside guy. And I always looked at it as, I think they really liked Jacoby Myers in there. I, I know they liked Jacoby Myers on the inside. And I know they like what he brings specifically as a blocker, especially when their offense is so centered around their run game and and everything that they want to do on early downs to be able to dictate to defenses what kind of game they're about to be in for when they play the New England Patriots. So I know Jacoby Myers has been their interior guy. He's been really productive in there. But 
I don't blame people for looking at it and saying, well, wouldn't you love to have a low cut slot receiver in the mold of Troy Brown and Wes Welker, Danny Amendola, and even Julian Edelman, who's a little bit different than, than those three guys and that you could use him inside and out. He was a little bit bigger. I think Edelman ended up 5'11", almost 200 pounds. So, you know, he was not a little putian out there, but be that as it may, they haven't had that guy. Is Marcus Jones that guy? (laughs) Now, Marcus Jones only caught 10 passes last year. 10 passes for 109 yards and a touchdown. But he's so explosive with the ball in his hands. You can see it in the return game. You can see it when he runs back interceptions. He's so fast. His long speed is so good. You You heard Belk talk about his balance and body control and his ability to change directions. And then to hear from Dana Holgerson via Belk that... Marcus Jones has the kind of slot receiver skill set that Wes Welker and Danny Amendola had as good, if not better, is the way Doug Belk put it. Dana Holgerson knows what it means to play receiver. He played receiver himself back in the 90s when he was in college. He coached the position at, at Valdosta State. He coached it under Mike Leach at Texas Tech before co- becoming an OC and a head coach. Obviously, now he's the head coach of the Cougars. But that guy has seen some some receivers now. And and again, Coach Welker and Amendola at Texas Tech. And he's looking at Marcus Jones and saying, this guy can do what those guys did. I'm not sure how your eyebrows aren't on the ceiling after you hear that. So even if you're disappointed the Patriots didn't come away with a slot receiver of the future in this year's draft class, maybe you hold out some hope that they ended up getting a guy who could contribute in there. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that he is going to be a full-time slot period end of story. I know he was scouted as a corner and a return man primarily. When the Patriots were going into day two of the draft, You know, I, I spoke to some people who said, keep an eye out for that guy from Houston, Marcus Jones, because he's a fit. And if you watched us on BST that night, the Friday night of the draft, you hear me talking up Marcus Jones because we know he's on the board and we know the Patriots are about to pick. And then Albert Breer sitting right there with us and he's tipping picks. God bless him. We love you, Albert. And he said, Hey, Marcus Jones, that guy Phil was just talking about. He goes off to the board to the Patriots. So I know it's going to be primarily corner and return man, but, but we will be keeping our eyes peeled for some receiver reps from Marcus Jones. There is no doubt about that when training camp rolls around. Now, I'm not sure how much of him we'll see this spring. He's recovering from shoulder injuries, shoulder procedures that prevented him from working out prior to the draft. And so we may not see him uh, just yet when we're out to practice at the end of May and then into June, uh, where we will have the opportunity to see several practices. I'm not sure how much of Marcus Jones we'll see, but he is expected to be ready by the time training camp rolls around. And again, fascinated to see if, we see him on the offensive side, maybe providing a home run threat in the middle of the field in the short to intermediate area of the field for Mac Jones, because he is, if you're an offense that's going to be based on catch and run opportunities, which the Patriots have been for a long, long time. Now that'll change to a degree with Tyquan Thornton in the mix now and Devontae Parker in the mix as well, but they love those yak guys and Marcus Jones, all five, eight, one seventy five of them, looks like a yak guy. I mean, he is, you know, Lance Zerline compared him to Dante Hall as a return man. That is, that is special, special change of direction ability, special speed. This guy is a, an amazingly fun player to watch. If you haven't watched clips of him already, Patriots fans, and you can see why he gets some of the comparisons that he's gotten. I mean, listen to that conversation with Doug Belk defensively the names he's bringing up offensively those texas tech slot receivers that are coming up dante hall from lance Zerline, our buddy friend of the next pats podcast greg cosell compared marcus jones as a defensive player to the honey badger tyron matthew so his size is what it is right that that's not going to change uh, unless he's able to put on a little bit of weight as he gets into his pro career here but the physical skill set and the aggressiveness and the football IQ and the home run ability in every phase of the game seems like it has the potential to be really special. So it'll be fun to see 
how it plays out as he gets rolling in his Patriots career here. One other note I wanted to mention before we get away from this episode and we start getting ready for next week's really interesting series of back and forths with uh, Patriots assistants. This week, we got the assistants on back-to-back days. They're required to speak twice in the offseason. My understanding is the Patriots wanted to get these things done as soon as possible. And they've done this before where they have media availability on back-to-back days because for obvious reasons, you know, the, uh, the storylines are limited and, uh, you know, if you're looking at this from a Patriots perspective or a Bill Belichick perspective, you're looking at it and saying, well, how many questions can those guys really have for, you know, Brian Belichick or DeMarcus Covington or Troy Brown, uh, on back-to-back days. So they did satisfy the rule. We'll see if that rule changes next year after this. But uh, I still did think there were a couple of interesting notes for us here on Next Pats to really dig into. And you can check back on uh, the most recent Patriots Talk podcast episode to hear myself and Curran talk about some of the other big picture takeaways that we got from Patriots assistance. But, you know, we heard about Cam McGrone. We heard about Ronnie Perkins. We heard about uh, Tyquan Thornton from Troy Brown. We heard a lot of good young player discussion during some of these conversations. And again, we'll get to some of those. The one that I wanted to point out, though, here before we leave is, is the Josh Uche note that we were able to glean from Stephen Belichick. And I asked him because the, the conversation had been steered in a way that we were talking about players that the Patriots have lost. Kyle Van Noy, Dante Hightower, obviously big names, staples for this Patriots defense, really important, not only in terms of what they brought to the table physically, but mentally as well. And just all this institutional knowledge that players like that bring to the defensive side of the ball in New England. And now that they're gone, what do the Patriots do? The obvious sort of follow to me for Steve was, okay, what's going on on the edge? we've talked about this on the podcast before, but that position has gone curiously unaddressed to me this off season. It's one of the most important positions in the sport for the Patriots. It's the, it's the outside linebacker spot. That's actually Steve Belichick's position group. It has been for the last few years. One of the most highly paid positions in the sport. And we know they addressed it in a big way last off season with Matt Judon, but this off season, really nothing. You lost Kyle Van Noy, who played almost 500 snaps on the edge for you last year. And you do have Dietrich Wise, who's still around, uh, but he's not a true outside linebacker. He's, he's more of a 4-3 end, and when they're in sub-situations, and you might want to get uh, a pass rush specific player out on the field, somebody who could play on the edge and maybe even a little bit inside in those sub-situations. Wise makes a lot of sense. But after Judon... To me, you've got a lot of question marks on that edge spot. And so I asked specifically about Uche because the other name that I think could end up making an impact next year, we don't know, is Ronnie Perkins. I mean, we we quite literally did not see him play a snap last year as a rookie. So to me, the guy that looks like the one who would be getting the first crack at those reps that have been vacated by Van Noy is Josh Uche, second round pick elite athlete coming out of Michigan back in 2020. But what can he bring the Patriots when you're looking at a player who, you know, he's been banged up, but he played just 241 snaps last year in 12 games. And that includes the six, one, two, three, four, five, six, six snaps he played in the playoff loss to the Buffalo Bills last year. That guy's going to be starting for you potentially six snaps in a postseason game when you could have used all the defensive help you could get. Why are the Patriots? So if the Patriots feel that way, why are they feeling that way? Why are they so confident in him? And we did hear confidence from Steve Belichick when it came to Josh Uche. I'll just read you the quote. Now he says, quote, I see him as part of the blueprint. I see him being an important piece to the puzzle for us going forward. There's a lot of factors to it besides 
what he's going to do. We have to see what everybody else does and work the pieces around from there. I see Josh being a big part of this defense. We'll see how the competition plays out. Josh is another guy who's doing everything right, who's putting a lot of hard work in, setting up as well as he could to help us out on the field once we get to camp. It's all a building process. He's done everything right so far. That seemed optimistic to me from Steve Belichick. And again, it it would make sense as to why they didn't add at that position if they feel like Josh Uche is a starting caliber player. We just haven't seen it. You know, 241 snaps last year. The number two years ago for him as a rookie was 179. He didn't play until week eight, dealing with injury. You know, that's sort of been the issue for him. So can he stay healthy? Can he stay on the field? And when he's on the field, can he be used across situations? So you're not using him necessarily only in these specialty pass rushing types of roles because the number two outside linebacker in this defense is a, that's a starter. You know, maybe he's changing the scheme. Maybe you see more four down looks this year. You know, maybe it is more Dietrich wise on the edge and, and wise ends up getting starter snaps. But to me, Uche seems to be the guy who is really poised for a bigger role. And my feeling was only reinforced by what we heard from Steve Belichick this week. So I wouldn't put it in pen, but I might put it in pencil. Uche across from Judon. Again, another player would be interesting to watch this spring and summer. Uche lit it up last offseason. Looked like one of the best athletes on the field at times. And it looked like he was poised to make that quote unquote year two leap. Didn't end up happening, but maybe it's year three for Josh Uche. Another friend of the next Pats podcast. We had him on the pod a couple of years ago, soon after he was drafted. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to this episode. Thanks so much to Doug Belk, Houston associate head coach, defense coordinator and defensive backs coach. Great conversation there. Again, that's a name you're going to want to keep an eye on because, uh, He's going places. He's already going places at 34 years old. Uh, but he, he's somebody that I would expect we continue to hear about in the years ahead in the college football ranks and who knows, maybe even the pro ranks. Uh, but thank you to him. Thanks to Houston for helping us set up that interview with Doug Belk. And thanks to you guys for listening. Please rate, comment, subscribe. Certainly more coming your way about this 2022 Patriots draft class and how this roster is shaping up as they head into OTAs, mandatory mini camp and training camp in July. Thanks so much, guys. We'll talk to you very soon.